It has been said that as much as 30% of this book, the Bible, is prophecy. For example, Jesus himself said on multiple occasions, and now I have told you before it comes to pass, that when it is come to pass, you might believe. In other words, he tells us in advance. The evidence that scripture gives that Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah is prophecy. How can we know that Jesus existed at all? Well, we turn to history, historians from that time period. Historians weren't even Christians who wrote about a man called Jesus. Tacitus is one of those historians. He wrote in his work, Annals, around AD 115, Christus, from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our procurators, Pontius Pilate. And Tacitus was referred to as the greatest historian of ancient Rome. Now, there were others that referred to Jesus and his followers. Josephus, a Jewish historian, also mentioned Jesus in, in reference to the trial of James, the brother of Jesus. In his work, Antiquities, which was only written about 60 years after Jesus died, about between AD 90 and 95, he wrote, So he assembled the Sanhedrin of Judges and brought before them the brother of Jesus, who is called Christ. So we have ancient sources, non-biblical sources, that specifically tell us that Jesus was crucified under Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor. Tacitus, Josephus, and many others tell us that he was a real historical figure. This being the case, the question is not, did Jesus of Nazareth exist, but rather, was he who he claimed to be? Was he the Christ, the Savior of the world? When it comes to the prophecies of Jesus, one of the most remarkable things is what takes place when you take those prophecies of Jesus and you work them out mathematically. Now there has been a mathematician who's done that. Peter Stoner, famous mathematician, went in, looked at how many prophecies there were, 300 prophecies. And then as he broke down those prophecies, he said, let me just take eight of them and figure out what's the likelihood of eight of these prophecies being fulfilled in one person's life. So Professor Stoner gives us an illustration. It helps us to understand the nature of probability. So let's just say that one in every 10 men that you meet has a bald head. And one in every 100 men that you meet happen to have a missing finger. You want to find out how many men are there that I'm going to bump into that actually have a missing finger and a bald head. So what you do is you multiply the first two figures and then you have your answer. One in every 1,000 men that you meet are going to actually have a missing finger and a bald head. Peter Stoner presented his class with a challenge. The class was to look at the Bible and try to find all the prophecies regarding the coming of Christ to see what was the probability that one man could come out of all the men that existed in the, in the history of the world and yet fulfill exactly every single prophecy. One of the prophecies that Peter W. Stoner mentions is Zechariah 9.9 which reads, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation as he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the fall of a donkey. The question is, is how many people in earth's history have been kings? And of those individuals, how many have ridden on a donkey into Jerusalem? Well, I don't know. Neither did the class, so they decided to assign an absurdly high number. They decided one out of every 100 men who ever lived rode into Jerusalem as a king on a donkey of all things. I mean one in a hundred. This is obviously absurdly high, but that's the point. Stoner effectively buffered his calculations and thus his conclusions against objections that he had biased his calculations to favor Jesus' identification as the Messiah. Another prophecy that Professor Stoner looked at was Micah chapter 5 and verse 2. In Micah 5 verse 2, there's an incredible prophecy that is given hundreds of years before the birth of Christ, pinpointing exactly the place where Jesus would be born. It states, But you, Bethlehem Ephrata, Though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel. What's amazing is the fact that there are two Bethlehems, two cities called Bethlehem in Israel, one in the northern portion of the kingdom, one in the south. Uh, this specifies which Bethlehem. 
that specifies Bethlehem Ephrata, which is Bethlehem in Judah. So the prophecy is very precise. But in addition to that, when you think about Mary and Joseph, uh, Mary finds out that she's pregnant. She's in Nazareth. And yet suddenly this decree comes out. This census is being proclaimed by the Romans. And they're told that they have to go back to the birthplace of the husband. And so Joseph makes his way to Bethlehem in Ephrata. They have to take their family back to Bethlehem. Joseph has to be taxed according to Roman law. Jesus is born in Bethlehem. The prophecy fulfilled right to the very, very place where Micah, hundreds of years earlier, predicted it to be to happen it was just remarkable when you think about all the circumstances involved. So Stoner and his students, they decided that they wanted to figure out in the light of the world's population, how many people have actually been born in the city of Bethlehem? One out of every 280,000 people was a very conservative estimate that they made, that they found mathematically, of how many people have actually been born in Bethlehem. Now another prophecy they looked at is found in the 53rd chapter of the book of Isaiah. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. Stoner brings this out, that Jesus was a just man, condemned to die, and he said not a word, not one word in his defense. Now how many have done that? Well, his class didn't know. Of course not, how could you know? So here again, they assigned a conservatively high number. For the purposes of their calculations, they said, okay, how about one in every thousand men who ever lived were both wrongly accused of a crime and during their trial chose to speak no word in their defense? And then as he broke down those prophecies, he said, let me just take eight of them and figure out what's the likelihood of eight of these prophecies being fulfilled in one person's life. So just with those eight prophecies, he said the probability of one person fulfilling all eight was one in 10 to the power of 17. That's like taking silver dollars all over Texas. They covered the entire state. And on one of those coins, somewhere in the state, you have a particular coin marked with a black X. And he just put it randomly, stir it up somehow, and randomly put it somewhere in the state of Texas, covered two feet deep with these silver dollars, and you send a blind man in. The probability that he would just wander the state of Texas, reach down on his first try, and come up with this marked silver dollar is the probability that one man could fulfill all eight of these prophecies about Jesus. Now, not only that, but it actually, he went further and he said, all right, let me see if I take 48 of these, 48 out of the 300, okay? What's the probability that one man in the history of the world could fulfill just 48 of these prophecies? And the number was a staggering one man out of one with 157 zeros after it. That number is so big, just to give you an idea, Scientists have determined that there are only one with 80 zeros after it, atoms, in the entire universe. That's not just our, our planet or our solar system or our galaxy, but the entire universe only has one with 80 zeros after it. There's not even enough atoms in the universe in order to hold that number. Now, this answers the question about some people say, well, you know, maybe a lot of people have met these prophecies. Maybe it's not just, uh, you, you know, Jesus, that you could have a whole bunch of people who meet all of these prophecies, but that's just not possible. It's so mind-boggling, it's so impossible, and that's not even close to the probability of what it would be to fulfill 48, which is one with 157 zeros after it. Staggering, staggering, that's only 48 prophecies, there are 300. What you've got in here is you've got something so remarkable that the whole universe can hold it. In fact, this is what Peter Stoner said. He said, any man who rejects Christ as the Son of God is rejecting a fact proved perhaps more absolutely than any other fact in the world. 
It's one thing to analyze a number of prophecies that specifically talk about the life and character of Christ, but what if there was a prophecy that made all of these other prophecies date sensitive? Meaning, what if there was a prophecy that specifically told us when all of these prophecies would have to be fulfilled? That prophecy we find in Daniel chapter 9. Here in Daniel chapter 9, we are given a fascinating prophecy hundreds of years before the time of Jesus that pinpoints the exact time of when the Messiah would be anointed. We have here the most precise prophecy about the Messiah in terms of when the Messiah would come of anywhere in the Old Testament. Reading here in verse 25, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. Now what does that mean? That word for week in Hebrew can either mean weeks of days or it can mean weeks of years. Daniel recognizes the same thing in his prophecies, that one day is a year. Therefore, he knows that in this 70 weeks is 70 weeks of years, which means 490 years. The way it works is like this. There are 490 years. We need to find the starting point. That's the key. In Daniel 9.25, it says that the starting date was from the decree that would restore and rebuild Jerusalem. Then Messiah would come onto the stage of human affairs. So we find the starting date. We go forward into the future, 483 years, and we have found the date in which the Messiah is supposed to begin His work on planet Earth. The beginning date of the seven-week prophecy is obviously 457 B.C. Now, there are some other decrees that have gone out at this time, but this is the one that invokes God accomplishing it. So we know that this is the beginning date, 457 B.C. All right, if you take 457 B.C., and now you come forward 483 years, what do you get? 27 A.D. As the time when, according to Daniel 9, the Messiah would come. What does that mean? The prophecies are about a Messiah, but what is Messiah? The Hebrew people wouldn't know what that means, but what does that mean to us? The word Messiah comes from a Hebrew verb which means to anoint. So Messiah is anointed, and in ancient times that was the way someone was marked for office. So the question arises, was Jesus of Nazareth anointed in AD 27? The Messiah appears and becomes the anointed one precisely at that point in AD 27 as Daniel prophesied in Daniel 9. What does that mean? He would begin his ministry. He would appear in that year. Well, what happened in 27 A.D.? Luke chapter 3, verse 1. Luke 3, verse 1 says that in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, and then it goes on to describe Jesus' baptism. The 15th year of Tiberius happened to also be the date of A.D. 27, the exact year when Jesus Christ was baptized. So we have the Jordan River and we have John baptizing. Jesus comes to John and John baptizes Jesus. Now the word baptize comes from the Greek word baptizo. Baptizo means to emerge, to dip. It was a term widely used as in the immersion of dyes and cloth, that they would fully take that cloth and immerse it in that dye, completely covering it. So Jesus was completely submerged and brought out. And when he was brought out, the light from God shone upon him and the Holy Spirit descended on him as a dove. And that is when Jesus, the Messiah, was anointed. And so we can clearly see that there's a shadow of a doubt that nearly 500 years before the event took place, it was predicted and fulfilled in the life of Jesus Christ. So Jesus is baptized immediately after he's baptized. And John the Baptist confesses that he's the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Jesus goes to preach his first sermon. He says, the time is fulfilled for the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. So when Jesus came and proclaimed the time is fulfilled, 
what he is indicating is that Daniel's great prophetic time clock has struck the zero hour. It is time for the Messiah to arrive. It's fascinating enough that the Bible tells us when the Messiah would be anointed, but the Bible even goes further to tell us the year when the Messiah would be crucified. Daniel 9 predicted precisely when Jesus would come as Messiah. Now there were some people in the early Christian age who didn't like the fact that so many people were becoming Christians because of this passage. In certain Jewish literature, they have a curse on you who study, some, study this prophecy because I think it's very powerful evidence pointing to Jesus as the Messiah. And they were very threatened by this passage because it was too overwhelming that it pinpointed the individual who was supposed to come to the very year. Now, what happens in the rest of the passage? What does it say? The prophecy of Daniel 9 tells us that in the middle of that week, in other words, about three and a half years, into the last week or seven years of Daniel's 70-week prophecy, the Messiah would be cut off, but not for himself. So three and a half years after the baptism, the anointing of the Messiah, he would be cut off at the end of the sacrifices would happen. Three and a half years after AD 27 brings us to the spring of AD 31. AD 31, the spring of AD 31, and particularly the, the Passover in the spring of AD 31, would be the Passover at which Jesus was crucified. And how significant it is, we discover that after a ministry of about three and a half years, Jesus was crucified in the spring at Passover time of the year AD 31. In other words, Jesus, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, was sacrificed for our sins just at the same time of the year that the Passover lamb was sacrificed. The word cutoff in Hebrew is karat. And this verb karat is used of a divine penalty for sinners back in the books of Moses, particularly Leviticus, Numbers, and so on. It's a divine penalty that God himself would administer. It's not simply capital punishment, but it's like a, a death beyond death. It's like a second death. There is accountability that goes to the afterlife. The person who's cut off doesn't get an afterlife. It's like a, a second death, a death that goes beyond death. All right, well, now we understand the background. But here we have in Daniel 9, 26, the Messiah. It uses that word Mashiach, from which we get the English word Messiah. When Jesus went into the Garden of Gethsemane, and he was beginning to experience this sundering, this separating from his father. He said, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to the point of death. In other words, my soul is dying. And he's going to be cut off, suffer this terrible penalty? What kind of sin has he done? How could this be? Well, there's only one explanation. You've got to put it with Isaiah 53. He doesn't die for his own sins. He dies for the sins of his people. This is not an ordinary death, a first death. This is a second death. The, uh, the final moments of Christ's life on earth were quite tragic. Uh, his friend uh, betrayed him, Judas. One of Jesus' own followers, Judas Iscariot, betrayed Jesus uh, for the sum of 30 pieces of silver. It's amazing to think that Zechariah had predicted precisely that it would be 30 pieces of silver, and that's exactly what Judas received for betraying Christ. He uh, regretted his bargain rather immediately and tried to give the money back, uh, and then went out and killed himself. So keep in mind that the prophecy says that in AD 31, that the Messiah would be cut off, or he would be crucified. So. Jesus, knowing this, understood that his life would be a mechanism that would offer salvation to the world. Therefore, he was willing to do anything to accomplish his mission. He was beaten a number of times, uh, as much as possible, that was legal, without actually killing somebody. As, with skin being torn out of his, his body with each whip. Then after this, uh, he had to carry his cross but that didn't last because uh, he was already, yeah, I'm sure he had a lot of blood loss because of the uh, scourging. Crucifixion inflicted by the Romans was the most horrible punishment that anybody could go through at the time. 
It was a type of torture that is to bring death, but a slow death. People were impaled on a cross or on a pole. They were, nails were put through their hands and through their feet. The feet would have been placed together. The nail would have gone one single nail through both feet, nailing those feet to the cross. And the individual then, as he hung on the cross, would have to lift himself up every single time he breathed on those feet in order to allow his diaphragm to expand. Also, their blood would be actually burning inside them like a burning sensation because of the effect that crucifixion would have on the body. So it was torture in several different stages, and it was completely awful. It was the suffocating. It was the blood hurting. It was the thirst that they were feeling, and it was meant to be exactly that torture, and then eventually death. Jesus' death, of course, was not a death forced by the crucifixion. It was not a death of suffocation after days and days of, of, of hanging there on the cross. It was not a death of lack of loss of blood. Um, it was not a death because of the physical suffering that Jesus experienced. The, the way he died was not simply uh, because of the physical pain, but uh, because of a broken heart. Broken heart syndrome is a, um, it's a medical entity where the heart actually um, undergoes so much stress that uh, it looks like the person is having a heart attack. There can be absolutely no physical obstruction in someone's heart arteries, but it is the intense stress levels that can actually cause the body to respond in such a way that there is uh, a physical abnormality uh, such as this broken heart syndrome. The emotional pain was tremendous, the pressure, because if he would give in, the plan of salvation would not be realized. Broken heart syndrome is also known by the name Takasubu's disease. And Takasubu is actually a, uh, an octopus type trap and the shape of this trap is what the heart looks like when it is undergoing its damage. The, the patients who have this stress-induced cardiomyopathy or broken heart syndrome, you, these happen in patients who are undergoing an intense amount of stress. This is not a stress that is minor. So Jesus, while dying on the cross, uh, had all of the guilt and all of the sins of everyone in this world on his shoulders and the amount of mental anguish that he was undergoing could definitely have caused this broken heart syndrome and um, the chemical levels again in the body with that amount of emotional stress would have been enough to trigger something like this to happen. Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 6 says and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all and so from that prediction, many hundreds of years before the crucifixion, we are told that Jesus' death would not be a result of all these physical things that happened, but a, a result of his separation from his Father, but more importantly, the weight of the sin of the world that, that crushed his heart, crushed his, his being, that he paid for there at the cross. And even though he suffers this cutting off, because it wasn't for his own sin. He comes forth from the death from which there is no return to give us salvation and to give us hope. And this is an incredible thing. So the prophecy of Daniel 9, 27 says, in the middle of the week, he will cause the sacrifices and the offerings to cease. Well, when did that happen? Three and a half years after AD 27 brings us to the spring of AD 31, precisely when Jesus died on the cross. Jesus, about three and a half years later, in the middle of that last seven weeks of years, Jesus died. Did he bring the sacrifice and offering to an end? Depends what you mean. When a person had committed a sin, he was supposed to bring a sacrifice. Uh, various kinds of animals were committed for sacrifice. It was replacement, a substitution being offered for them. Jesus was the fulfillment of those sacrifices and symbols. And that's why John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. And so we don't go to a Hebrew sanctuary. We go in faith to the hill of Calvary there, where the Son of God is dying in our behalf. And as the scripture says, God made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, 
so that the righteousness of God may be fulfilled in us. The death of Christ in the middle of the week, in the spring of AD 31, is uh, without a doubt the most significant solid historical evidence that Jesus Christ is truly the Savior of the world that was predicted. I mean, it's incredible to think that he died just on time, just the way the Bible described. I mean, a prophecy of Daniel hundreds of years earlier, written in the sixth century, predicting that precisely the event of Christ's death. This was in the middle of the final week of years, which is between 27 AD and 34 AD. Okay? What happened in 34 at the end of the 490 years? This was the time that you read about in Acts chapter 7. In Acts chapter 7, Stephen was a deacon who was filled by the Holy Spirit. He was doing evangelism. And there were those then who turned him in to the authorities, and he was arrested. He gave an incredible speech, and then he was stoned to death at the end of this time. The gospel was rejected by the leaders among the covenant people, and it was taken to the Gentiles by the Apostle Paul in fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecy. According to Acts chapter 15, we see that the boundaries are broken down. Gentiles, other people like me, can come directly to Christ without having to become Jewish first. We can come to Him. Jewish people can come to Him. Hindus and Muslims and all different kinds of people, everybody can come to Him directly as our Messiah. We can all be spiritual descendants of Abraham. You know, here is a prophecy, five, six hundred years before the event took place, and pointing out exactly the ministry of Christ, his death, the destruction of Jerusalem. It is incredible. Not only does the Bible tell us to the year when he would come and begin his ministry, it tells us where he would be born, the tribe from which he would come. This all adds up to something that cannot be manipulated. This had to be divine foreknowledge revealed and prophesied right here in Micah, in Daniel, and then the other prophecies pointing in the nature of what he was going to do, what he was going to accomplish, how he was going to die, all of these different kinds of things. It all comes together to indicate that God really knows what he he's doing. and We can have confidence that when he says that he's going to deliver us, that he can do that. But it's the resurrection which, in a sense, puts the seal on this and gives us powerful, powerful reasons for believing in the whole plan of salvation as revealed in the New Testament. It has been said that Jesus Christ was the greatest man in history. He had no servants, yet they called him master. He had no degree, yet they called him teacher. He had no medicines, yet they called him healer. He had no army, yet kings feared him. He won no military battles, yet he conquered the world. He committed no crime, yet they crucified him. He was buried in a tomb, and yet he lives today. As I think back on what helped me to become a Christian, it was Jesus Christ. And as I discovered these prophecies as a young person, 15 years of age, coming from a secular background, I was opening up the prophecies of Daniel, going to a Daniel seminar, and I discovered that Jesus had come on time, had died on time, and that now I was confronted with the evidence. What would I do with this Christ? It was proved beyond a shadow of a doubt for me that this Jesus had come. As I see those things fulfilled in history and even in the world today, I can be sure as a Christian that the Bible is the Word of God. The Roman governor Pontius Pilate, he wakes up on that morning and he has no clue, no clue whatsoever what he's going to face that day. And what he ends up encountering is the very face of Jesus Christ. Whether or not that's what he expected, that's what he got. It's the same with us. We wake up in the morning and we don't expect that today is the day I might find the evidence that would suggest that I need a savior and that Jesus Christ was truly the Messiah. Now I had to figure out what will be my response. And as I looked at that information, I said, if Jesus does exist, 
if he wants a relationship with me, then I need to, to find out more about it, to, to figure out what it is. And I think that nothing else is more important. It's the most important thing. Everyone owes it to themselves to study these things out, to scrutinize the scriptures for themselves. And so I began that process. And as I read into my Bible and I read the Gospels, the Bible came alive. And, and I discovered that relationship. My life has not been the same. Jesus is standing before Pilate. And the question that Pilate asks cynically is, what is truth? And surely this is one of the great ironies of history. Pilate says, what is truth? A better question would have been, who is the truth? Because the very one who in the sweep of human history claimed to be the very embodiment of truth was standing right there in his midst. And Pilate, because he was swayed by public opinion, he was a slave to public opinion, was unwilling to find out the answer. The question is, are we, unlike Pilate, willing to find out just what is the truth?